Welcome to the first primetime debate dedicated to periodontally compromised tooth in the aesthetic area. Now, to oversee the two treatment options, periodontal regeneration or implant therapy, my co-host Luca Cordaro has invited three specialists. Goran Benic from Switzerland, Where Francesco Cairo from Italy and Jan Cosin from Belgium. Now, Luca, would you like to introduce tonight's topic and experts? Okay. Our evening is focusing on replacement of teeth in the anterior zone. And mm -hmm. we all know that this is a pretty challenging situation when you add to the thing that you're losing a, a tooth, mm. the fact that this is lost for periodontal disease. If we can have the first slide just to confine <coughs> the uh, topic tonight, I will show this case that uh, presented to my attention uh, many, many years ago. She was uh, under, period, under orthodontic treatment and she felt that something was going wrong. She went to me and it was clear that this patient was treated uh, for um, tooth movement without uh, uh, the diagnosis of periodontal disease. And you can clearly see here that uh, uh, we have an advanced periodontitis involving many elements. And these patients have uh, multiple dental issues and need a comprehensive treatment plan. First of all, they need, of course, to treat the disease, as was stated by Alberto Fonser earlier this evening. And uh, we will focus tonight only on the front teeth, but uh, of course, these patients need to be treated globally. Uh, and why do we focus on the front teeth? Because uh, when you lose bone for advanced periodontal disease, it's a big challenge to achieve uh, an aesthetically uh, acceptable solution. So if uh, you can see in the next slide, uh, the first thing we need to do is to start controlling the disease and then we can make a treatment plan. And in this case, you see the right central upper incisor has a deep pocket with the bone resorption up to the apex. <coughs> and uh, uh, the question is now what we're going to do. And our experts here are going to, to help us in making this decision. But before we do that, I would like the audience to vote. And if we can show the next slide, they, will, uh, uh, they, will, they could choose about three, three, four treatment options to maintain the tooth and perform periodontal regeneration to extract a tooth and place an, impl an immediate implant without a restoration. Third option would be an immediate implant with a restoration. <clears throat> and the fourth option would be to extract, wait for healing, and go for a stage uh, uh, delayed implant placement. Exactly. Now, Luca, uh, it is, the voting is really to make sure that you have a stake in this debate. We want you to choose before, at the end of the debate, you will share with us what you did. And if you're just joining us, voting is done in the same way as during the battle and the Is It True session. So you can now scan the QR code, which is on your screen, or use that same QR code, it's the same code if you missed it, which is right below the live stream player in the platform. And if you scan the code, you enter up in our Slido website, where you you now see the four options that you can choose from. What would you do in Luca's case that he just presented? Maintain the tooth and perform periodontal regeneration. Extract and place an immediate implant without restoration. Extract and place an immediate implant with immediate restoration. Or extract and go for stage procedure. You vote, you listen. As you know by now, you can during the debate change your vote. But we'll hear what you did, Luca, at the end of the debate. But before we see how I solved the case, let's see how our friends here uh, will uh, um, approach this case. And we start with Francesco Cairo from the University of Florence, an Italian colleague, uh, master in periodontology, and uh, he will uh, address the approach of saving the tooth and go for periodontal regeneration. So Francesco, please explain your reasons. Thank you very much, Luca, for your introduction and uh, good evening to all of you. And uh, now we have uh, the first image is a clinical case that I treated in 2008, so a lot of time ago. Uh, she's a female patient, uh, um, 39 years, and uh, no smoking habits and no systemic disease. And she was really concerned about the, the high mobility of the central incisor. And the next slide, we can see the uh, advanced gingival inflammation. And then, and the next one, we can assess, uh, as in the case presented by 
Dr. Cordaro, the advanced bone lesion, especially at the upper central incisor. Uh, so the diagnosis uh, is quite simple because we are treating uh, a case of chronic periodontitis. At the time, today is a stage three grade C uh, periodontitis. And in the next slide, we are going to assess the, uh, the real issue of this presentation, that is the upper and uh, central incisor, uh, with a, a very deep infrabony defect close to the apex. When looking at the um, clinical uh, aspect of the case, we have a severe uh, pockets ranging from 8 to 10 millimeters and advanced tooth mobility degree number 2. So a very difficult case, but at the time we were uh, in 2008, the evidence was enough for supporting periodontal regeneration and uh, this was my clinical choice. So in the next uh, slide, we can have the video, the surgical video of the time. Uh, so you can uh, uh, see now the papillary preservation flap that is a, a key factor in periodontal regeneration. I'm going to create a cuspid to cuspid flap, so a very large flap we are going, because we are going to treat a very deep infrabony defect, and this is the specific step of papillary preservation step. I'm going to separate the connective tissue of the interdental papilla from the granulation tissue. This is a very important task of the surgery. Then I move my curettes into the defect in order to remove all the granulation tissue and to expose the root surface in order to clean and to evaluate the infrabony defect. It's a very large one wall infrabony defect with a, an important component also at the palatal side. So a very difficult infrabony defect. And this was the measurement and the reconstructive treatment by using a xenograft that is going to support, obviously, a collagen membrane in order to promote periodontal regeneration, so a new attachment, bone fill, and also clinical attachment gain. And this is the closure of the flap by combining an horizontal and crossed suture in order to stabilize both palatal and uh, uh, buccal flap, and then the closure of interdental papilla by internal and vertical mattress suture, and finally, a combination of single suture in order to obtain uh, uh, the perfect uh, closure of the flap that is uh, critical in order to promote regeneration. So, in the next slide, we can assess the final healing. I mean, this is the one-year follow-up healing. The patient was followed in a under strict plaque control by professional origin procedure, and then at the end of the story, we have the post-surgical re-evaluation. So, Francesco, a first comment. Now, you are one year after the first surgery, and you still have uh, uh, the, to correct the aesthetic problem here. So, uh, this approach is for sure very conservative. You're keeping uh, the tooth that is uh, really compromised at the beginning, but it takes time. Yeah, this is the dark side of the moon in this type of case. Okay. Absolutely, okay. because it's a time demanding. And uh, I mean, we need to wait a lot of time for having uh, a nice healing of the deep infrabony component and in order to potentially move our tooth in order to improve also aesthetics. So how are you going to solve this issue at, this, at the moment? Well, uh, according to the patient, we start with antodontic treatment. Uh, I mean, the overall condition were pretty good because we were no, we had no residual pockets and, and resolution of infrabony defect, but look at the um, condition of the tooth. So uh, we started with the orthodontic treatment, uh, around nine months of orthodontic treatment, as you can see in the next slide, and then in the next one again, and then again in the next one. So in around nine months we corrected the tooth position, and then at the end of the story we can assess the final outcomes. An another issue here, aren't you afraid of moving the tooth into where we had the previous large defect? Yes, this is a very controversial issue with very uh, few evidence, unfortunately. Uh, what we know, I mean, is to avoid, in my mind, especially in my mind, a uh, very um, uh, rapid movement into the defect and to wait a lot of time in order to obtain a stable healing of the infrabonic component. I don't like to start with the, the orthodontic movement immediately after surgery or two or three months after surgery. 
although I understand that there are new arising uh, data that seems to suggest it, but my approach is really, really slow. Conservative, conservative. And you have to be as good as you are to <coughs> convince the patient to have this exceptional oral hygiene that we saw there. Yeah, but my patients are beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I'm wondering, if I listen to you, uh, Francisco, why? Hey, you mentioned after a year you're still augmenting. You say, yeah, it's the dark side of the, of the, the, the moon. Why do you choose to be so conservative and take so much time? Well, because the, the primary... Uh, Patient request was to save tooth ah. and uh, to preserve uh, aesthetics. So this, is a, in my mind, is a critical point and also maybe a possible point for our discussion, the patient request. Obviously, when clinical condition may allow a um, proper treatment or a predictable treatment. Uh, the clinical characteristic of the defect suggest and support the feasibility of periodontal regeneration. Mm -hmm. Let's see how these cases ended. Yeah. And this was the baseline again. Uh, we were in uh, 2008 at uh, incredible pockets. And this was, again, the other image, the infrabony defect. You can see now in the next picture. Uh, so a very deep infrabony defect, around 8, 9 millimeters of uh, infrabony component. In the next slide, we have the final follow-up in uh, 2021. So uh, 13 years of follow-up. In the final slide, we have the X-ray examination showing a stable uh, bone levels and a stable gingival margin, and patient is absolutely happy of the treatment that we perform. And obviously, the patient is maintained under a strict supported periodontal care every month with no plaque into the mouth. So a beautiful patient again. And a beautiful case. Thank you for sharing it with us. So uh, the next speaker is Goran Benish. He works at the University of Zurich in Switzerland and maintains a private practice uh, in Lugano, <coughs> in the Italian-speaking part of Switzerland. <laughs> um, and he would talk about uh, the opportunity to extract the tooth, but go then delayed for implant placement. Let's see what uh, he does and uh, how he supports his decision. Thank you, Luca. Thank you, everybody. It's a great pleasure to be here. So in our approach, of course, the first thing starts, I mean, with the uh, evaluation of the tooth. So, but if the tooth is deemed to be unreasonable to treat, and if there are high aesthetic, <laughs> aesthetic risks, so this is a topic of, of this debate, of course, we're in an aesthetic region. In the most cases, we're going to extract the tooth and go for the delayed implant placement. Now, in the next slide, we see the intraoral situation. This relatively young female patient has uh, high aesthetic expectations. And we observe around the tooth 2-1 two that there is a periodontal infection. So there is swelling. There is a, a buccal fistula. Uh, and we have increased so periodontal pockets on the buccal and interproximal regions, which means that uh, on the buccal aspect, there is no bone. And in addition, we do start with a soft tissue recession despite the presence of the swelling. And this together with high scalloping and relatively medium or maybe even thin biotypes. So it's really a risky case. And these are three arguments why we go for extraction and delayed approach. So in the next slide, of course, after the tooth extraction, which needs to be done in a very traumatic way. So this is generally easy for a periodontally compromised tooth. But uh, in some cases, you know, there might be, you know, maybe uh, more attachment. And so in the next sequence, you're going to appreciate this is a tool that I really like a lot and which is an atraumatic extractor. It's basically a screw which is inserted in the root. <coughs> and then with a strong tension, it's possible to remove the tooth without touching the soft tissue and the bone. It takes just a couple of minutes. In the most cases, it works very well. And so, again, it's very atraumatic. After this, the situation is, so we have this, this, uh, this socket. And please keep in mind, there is missing buccal plate. And we will always do the ridge preservation in this case. And I'm going to formulate this a little bit like a philosophic question. So why, really? Is it really about ridge preservation? And the answer is not. It's more about a soft tissue support and soft tissue preservation. Because in case of missing buccal plate, you're going to see in the next slide what happens. Three missing incisors, all three with missing buccal plate. You can see on the left side, 
if there is we go for spontaneous healing, so no grafting, we do lose a lot of volume and the width of keratinized mucosa. In the medium case, please uh, let's go back one more time. Uh, in the medium case, you see that if we uh, do the, uh, the just the bone substitute insertion without the without the soft tissue grafting, again we are going to lose. Uh, so please go back uh, to the slides. And finally, on the right side, uh, there is very good so, uh, support of the soft tissue. So again, it's basically about the soft tissue support, and we want the optimal aesthetic situation in this aesthetically sensitive area. I have a comment. <coughs> I have a comment at this time. Uh, we know from the studies uh, that come from the group in Bern, Vivian Chapuis, uh, that uh, when you extract a tooth and you leave the uh, socket for an assisted healing, if you lose the buccal bone, you have uh, uh, the mucosa that is reacting and the soft tissue are uh, somehow expanding the volume up to seven times. Mm -hmm. So if you uh, wait only eight weeks to go back, you really have a nice soft tissue situation because it is true that you don't maintain completely the volume, but you have a very thick mucosa to deal with uh, when you go back uh, and do your surgery. So why do you think that uh, alveolar ridge preservation will help in maintaining soft tissue support? I mean, this is an inter interesting theory, and of course this is based on comb beam CT measurements. So basically what they measure a soft tissue is the, the unmineralized part of the alveol after eight weeks. Now, this theory, I mean, it would be beautiful if this, this would, if we would be able to increase the soft tissue thickness by spontaneous healing, but honestly, I think it's too nice to be true. But this is, this is science, this is yeah. demonstrated. It's, I mean, let's put it's it published on Journal of Dental Research. So yeah, but this is just, a, uh, this is a basic measurement at eight weeks, and this is a reactive tissue thickness in the alveol. And so we don't know whether we are able by doing this to increase the soft tissue on the long term. And on the other side, there is evidence, for example, some studies from Zurich, which shows us that the augmentation of the buccal contour is provided 50% by hard tissue augmentation, but 50% by soft tissue augmentation. In other words, there are hardly any other uh, predictable technique to increase the thickness of the soft tissue than the soft tissue grafting. Yes, yes, in the long term for sure. Please go ahead. Yeah, okay, thank you very much. So again, please keep in mind these are cases, or this is a case with a missing buccal plate. So let's go back to our case on the next slide. And also, in addition to the missing buccal plate, we do start with a soft tissue deficiency. So we are gonna combine a soft tissue augmentation, so the grafting with the connective tissue graft, and gonna place before this some uh, xenograft, xenogenic bone substitute to support the soft tissue. And uh, in the next sequence, you're gonna see how do we, or where do we harvest the connective tissue graft. So typically, this is a single incision envelope technique. So basically, we prepare this pouch, and you can also imagine that after the harvesting, it's gonna be easy to gain the primary closure of this wound. And in the next sequence, you see that after cutting the periosteum, we pretty much remove the biggest part of lamina propria in the submucosa. Again, so we really take out quite, you know, voluminous uh, grafts. Again, so this is not uh, mucogingival surgery on teeth. Here, it's about gaining and augmenting volume in dental sites. Now, in the next slide, you can see in the upper left that we insert the bone substitute, again, to support the soft tissue. And then after the preparation uh, the tunneling preparation with uh, some micro-elevators, we insert the connective tissue graft and fix it with some uh, horizontal matrices on the buccal and palatal aspect. You can do some inter uh, interrupted sutures, I mean, that's, that's flexible. And then after uh, some months of healing, on the next slide, you're gonna appreciate the situation after three months. So it's about maintaining the soft tissue contour. When we open the flap, actually, ideally, the typical indi uh, indication, the next slide, you can gonna see this, is to re-enter already after two months. 
So we don't really necessarily wait for the integration of the bone substitute. Why is that? Because the more we wait, the more you lose the buccal contour, and then you would end, or we would end up in an atrophic one volt defect, which cannot be predictably managed with GBR, with collagen membranes. So the things get complicated. This is a very interesting concept because it's, it's sort of new. Uh, usually, uh, uh, alveolar ridge preservation procedures call for implant placement after four or six months. Now you're proposing it in, at an earlier stage. Very interesting. Absolutely, absolutely. So basically, it's the, in a static area, I think the main indication is type two uh, implant placement after eight weeks approximately. Again, in selected cases, we do ridge preservation to support the soft tissue, not in all the cases. So let's continue with the case. So. The GBR was performed, and this is the situation after four months of healing. We proceed with a minimally invasive abutment connection, which we can see in the next slide. And so you see this is really minimally invasive, and there are some variations. In the next slide, you're gonna see that this is done by uh, some depitalization and a mini U-form incision, which then later, on the next slide, you see this, is gonna flip is gonna be flipped on the buccal aspect, and this allows us to increase additionally in the buccal and vertical dimension the soft tissue volume. And then comes the pros part. This is the soft tissue conditioning. Now we do have an, quite an ugly black triangle, and it's, this is gonna be hard to, to expect to be filled spontaneously, so we help ourselves by modifying the crown form. And you see in the next slide that what we do is a non-preparation veneer. So we widen the tooth, we cover um, the entire buccal surface of the tooth one one, and finally, in the last slide, the final reconstruction together with colleague Sammy Huber, and uh, this was done by Tobias Fischli, a very uh, great technician from Zurich, and I think this is his second case tonight in the prime debate. <laughs> so let me wrap it up with the final slide. So we saw that in the cases with high aesthetic risk, with missing buccal plate and infection, there are four important elements why we choose delayed implant placement. First of all, we go for delayed implant placement to avoid increased risk of the infections. And in addition to this, we prepare for some causal healing. On the second aspect is that we go with hard soft tissue augmentation really to correct the soft tissue defect combined with ridge preservation. We go after two months and we choose an early implant placement, we raise the flap and we do a proper GBR, proper augmentation really to overbuild the bony defect. And finally, we go for submucosal healing because this is ideal for GBR healing and also gives us some flexibility to gain some softer tissue volume during the abutment connection. So overall, for these elements, uh, we think that this is the most predictable procedure for infection control to augment existing hard tissue defects and the soft tissue defects. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you, that was a great case. Just to, to summarize it, you did uh, a veneer, <laughs> two grafting, and a soft tissue grafting. But at the end, the case is perfect. Thank and you. It was, it was a challenging situation, and I think you solved it in a beautiful way. Of course, the overall treatment time for this patient was? It's quite long. I mean, it's definitely over six months. I mean, it's we are probably around nine months. Okay, yeah. but it's not too long. It's not too long. Nine months is acceptable. Yeah. We, we heard longer times in the first yeah, approach yeah. already. Uh, yeah, but at the end, he keeps the t she keeps the tooth. So that's that's true. That's, that's, really, true. that's really very important. different. That's Look, really do important. we have time for a clarifying question about this uh, case? Yes, of course. Yeah, we have uh, Maria Angeliki Alaxo. Pulu, I hope I pronounced that correctly, uh, Maria. She says, good evening. Since the buccal plate is missing, you just said, why didn't you add a collagen membrane to avoid epithelial invasion? It's a very good question. I mean, this is something controversial. I mean, uh, of course, the, it, it would be even safer, I mean, to do this, but of course, it would be definitely more invasive. Uh, but, uh, I mean, there is no large evidence to show that placing the, 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 the bioguide, so sorry, the, the collagen membrane is gonna be more predictable to gain, to gain more heart tissue healing. Yeah, so in our concept, we don't place. Uh, said, I, I didn't need it. There's no evidence and I could achieve the same result with this approach. Yeah, correct. Mm -hmm. yes. Thank you for your question, Maria. Yes, it's a very interesting question, but I would <coughs> not add any other complication to this kind of treatment. I have to say, 
that in these complex cases where you have to uh, take care of many issues in the patient mouth, I think <coughs> one of the keys should be to keep the treatment as simple as possible. So um, this is, I think, something that we will have time to discuss later on. But now we have our colleague from Belgium, from Ghent, Jan Kosin, head of periodontology there, and uh, we challenged him, <laughs> asking him <laughs> a difficult thing. If you, can, uh, if you can treat a case like this uh, by placing the implant immediately at the time of extraction and restoring it at the time of extraction. So Jan. Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you, Luca, for the invitation. Uh, I will do my best to, <laughs> to, to give you a, a case, uh, a periodontal case with an immediate implant placement, and then we can debate on that later on, probably. This is a female patient, 56 years old. She is a non-smoker, and she was referred to me in 2015 for periodontal therapy. Um, at the time, she had periodontitis uh, stage 2, uh, grade B, so let's say a moderate chronic periodontitis, and she was treated for that uh, through initial periodontal therapy and supportive care. Um, on the next slide, you will see that in 2017, so two years later, uh, she had a horizontal crown fracture on tooth 22. Um, this is the situation, the clinical situation. And on the next, next slide, we can see the intraoral radiograph and the comb beam CT image. We see an intact buccal bone with also a class one defect and enough apical bone to, an, to anchor an, an implant. So immediate implant placement is uh, very much possible in this case and is quite favorable, even though we had a five millimeter pocket on this tooth in 2015, this was reduced to three millimeter at the time of extraction and implant placement. So this again, uh, it's a clear indication. You're doing this because you have an intact fascial bony wall. Intact or nearly intact. Okay. We can have okay. a, a dehiscence, but yeah, okay. we can comment on that because it's quite a complex uh, discussion, but, but it does not need to be complete uh, in, all, in all cases. But at least it's not missing. It's not completely missing. No, no. that's, okay. Okay. I think, quite important. Now, um, if we look at the CBCT and we take that with lip, lip retractors, then we are also able to judge the, the gingival thickness, which is also important from a diagnostic point of view. So we have the buccal bone thickness, which is about one millimeter, and also the buccal gingival thickness is also about one millimeter. And these two criteria are quite important when we talk about soft tissue grafting in a next step. So the surgical procedure comes in three steps. And in the next slide, we will have the first step, which is, of course, tooth extraction and implant placement. We always do this procedure without flap elevation, and this is quite critical. Um, we take out the tooth as, as atraumatically as possible. We go for wound debridement. And here, free-handed implant placement was performed because the long axis of the implant or the site was uh, parallel to the long axis of the tooth. Whenever this is not the case, you should opt for a surgical guide, in my point of view. Very critical is that you ensure enough bone removal at the palatocervical aspect. If you don't do that, you will see that in the end, the, the implant will be tilted to the buckle and it is becoming a disaster in two seconds. That's, that's a pretty important trick that you're telling us. Yeah. So it's not in, in, in guidelines written somewhere, but it is very, very important to do it. Um, and then you, hear, you see here an image with the implant driver uh, sitting on the implant, showing a palatal inclination of the implant, which is also important from a restorative point of view, but also from an aesthetic point of view. Because you want to screw retain your restoration. Of Obviously, course. Of yeah, course. we try to avoid cementation. In the next slide, we will then have the discussion on how to manage the buccal bone gap. We know from basic studies from Araujo, Linde and Botticelli that immediate implant placement is not able to avoid post-extraction bone remodeling. So we want to fill up that gap, which is called buckle socket grafting, socket grafting using usually DBBM. 
which is a slow resorbing material. And this systematic review from Saisons, which is on the review, shows that on the basis of four randomized controlled trials, we have a 0.6 millimeter horizontal reduction in um, bone loss. So 0.6 millimeter less, less um, resorption in, in, in a horizontal dimension. This is not uh, the only thing, thing to say about that because apart from the hard tissues, in the next slide we will see that also in terms of soft tissue support, this is important. And uh, Lawrence could find four systematic reviews basically showing that when you perform socket grafting along with immediate implant placement, on average there is 0.6 millimeters less apical displacement of the soft tissue margin, so less recession. Given the fact that socket grafting is quite easy, it doesn't cost a lot of money in, 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 in respect to the whole treatment, it has become standard of care. So the cost-benefit ratio of this concept is, is favorable and should be done at all times in my point of view. If you go to the, the next slide, this is illustrated like that. Uh, there is one crucial step. It's just to make sure that the cover screw is installed before you enter the material. Otherwise, it comes into the internal compartment of the implant, which you don't, you don't want, obviously. <coughs> So at this time you have not yet elevated your buckle flap? No. Okay. At this time it, 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 has, it is a flapless procedure. Okay. okay. And then we come to the, let's say, supplementary step, uh, um, which does not need to be done at all in all cases, which is soft tissue grafting. So on the next slide you will see the uh, benefit of a connective tissue graft at the buckle aspect of such an immediate implant. Uh, which is uh, another systematic review of the same colleague from the department, showing on the basis of three randomized controlled trials that a soft tissue graft in that area reduces mid-facial recession to 0.4 millimeters on average. Now evidently, if you take into account the cost-benefit ratio of a soft tissue graft, when compared to socket grafting, it's another story because you need an extra surgical site so the cost-benefit ratio is lower. That means, in my point of view, it cannot be standard of care. You need to select the cases in order to do that. And uh, definitely high-risk patients or high-risk cases are pa patients with extremely thin buccal bone walls, less than 0.5 millimeter on CBCT, and or a thin gingival biotype, as in this particular case. And how do you proceed? We proceed with the connective tissue graft, and this is the, then the video on the third part of the surgical therapy, where we use micro-surgical blades to make a pouch very gently. Very important not uh, to come out buckly, of course, not to perforate. And it needs to be large enough to, to bring in the connective tissue graft. You can place it horizontally or vertically, but it should be uh, well aligned with the mucosal margin. So the entrance of the needle is quite critical making sure that the border of the connective tissue graft is at the level of the mucosal margin. And this is then inserted. Usually we take a free gingival graft for this purpose and we extra orally de-epithelialize this, arriving at the connective tissue graft of about one millimeter. And then this is also important, it should be combined with immediate restoration. It doesn't make any sense to go for an immediate implant without immediate restoration because the whole concept is built on speeding up the process. And how can you speed up the process if the, if the patient is walking out without a tooth? In my point of view, it doesn't make any sense then. So uh, this, this goes hand in hand. But also I think that there is some evidence that if you don't restore an immediate implant immediately, you are at risk of losing support of the soft tissues and then to end up with a, uh, non-favorable soft tissue design and no. lose some buckle profile. True. Uh, so so the, the, the reason uh, for this is mm. to, uh, to support the soft tissue, not only to, uh, to speed up the procedure. Of course. Okay. Okay, thank you very much to the three of you for uh, the very different approaches. We will have... Uh, do we have time for a clarifying question as well? Yes. We have yes. a live audience, Luca, and uh, people are listening uh, carefully and, uh, and, and they, they picked up 
on the conversation between the both of you in the beginning. This is uh, Garcia Sixto joining us from Peru, mm -hmm. not taking the evening option, but <laughs> actually a full day in the office. You talked about this specific case where the buccal wall was still there. And, and the question is, when is it too much about buccal wall dehiscence? Let's say it in a percentage or in millimeters or in CEG distance to the adjacent teeth. Can we determine when, wh wh where's the threshold? Please, well, go the, ahead. The, the, there is um, some evidence in the literature uh, clearly showing on the basis of case series, so, so quite low level of evidence, that you can perform this procedure when you have a dehiscence. Mm -hmm. uh, there is even evidence when you do this in periodontal patients, but then it comes down to one retrospective case series by, by Cecilia. Yes, a recent paper. A recent paper, yes, 2021. From our past president, Alberto Cecilia. Yeah. So. Um, Very interesting so, paper. So you can do that, but you have to bear in mind that there are no randomized controlled trials on that. Yeah. And, uh, okay, the implant survival is fine, the marginal bone loss in fi is fine, uh, the pink aesthetic score is fine, but there are no data on the buccal bone wall itself. There are no CBCT data. And the mid-facial recession uh, exceeding one millimeter is, uh, is there in above 20% of the cases. This is, I think, is one of the issues in our profession. There is no clear classification of defects, <laughs> either around the teeth or when the teeth are missing. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about these things, uh, the, the mm, photograph of the clinical scenario is not very precise. So it's a little bit on clinical judgment. But I, would, I think you would agree that the advanced periodontal cases where you have, uh, are not, uh, where you have, huge loss of attachment and of bone, you, you cannot go for this technique. I think you will agree. I think the case that I have shown, even with a dehiscence, is, is different from the cases of Francesco and Horan because they have active infection there at that failing tooth. Eh? Mm -hmm. But the critical thing is when you, when you do this immediate procedure, I think you should not raise a flap. Eh? Whenever you raise a flap, you lose wound stability eh? You, it is very difficult to have primary wound closure then, eh? and Tonetti has shown that in 2017 there is a multicenter RCT on that, showing a lot of soft tissue complications and a poor aesthetic outcome. So whatever you do, if you Don't opt for that. immediate placement, you should not make a flap. Exactly. Eh? And you should combine it with immediate restoration. That, that are, these are the two main conclusions <coughs> about that. Okay, thank yeah. you very much. So let's see how, how I treated this case, just to, just to see what the audience would have done. I'm so curious. Should we first check uh, the results of the <laughs> poll? If you join yes. us later, at the yes. beginning of this primetime debate, Luca has shared his case, and we asked you, what would you do in this initial case? And, and we can see, Luca, they're across the board. Uh, we see a little over half of the people would choose maintain the tooth and <laughs> periodontal <laughs> regeneration. We see Francesco cheering here I'm in the debate. I'm sorry. Of course, he says, of course. <laughs> On the other hand, we also see about 27% uh, going in, uh, in Goran's direction saying abstract and go for stage procedure. Yet, we still see some uh, in total, it's about 16% voting for immediate, and they're a bit divided about the restoration or not. And I think you just made a very clear point that one of the options should definitely be off the table. Yes, yes. I think that uh, in the aesthetic zone to place an implant, and I think that there is evidence for that, to place an implant immediately at the time of extraction, irrespective of a periodontal or a normal case, um, it makes no sense to go with only the implant placement without an immediate restoration. So this was clearly demonstrated by many studies. I think uh, I'm thinking about the ones from Joe Kahn in the US, but there are several studies also from your group, Ian, that have demonstrated this cl very clearly. So what did you do? Well, I went for the, uh, for the stage approach. Uh, I think that it is... Uh, uh, easier to perform, and this was a complex case. We had several issues. So what I did, I, I controlled the infection as much as possible. Then uh, I took the decision that this uh, um, defect, this bony defect that was going to the apex in, in such a situation, and it was a, a middle-aged woman, I would not dare to keep this tooth, and I extracted it. But I didn't go for very complex things. I just waited for healing, and then uh, 
as, a, as we usually do after eight weeks, we went back in. Uh, you can see it in the, in the next slide. After two months, uh, there was a, a huge bone defect. It was not possible to place the implant simultaneously. I decided to go for this uh, uh, mini block, uh, autogenous block graft, but this could be solved also with a GBR procedure, probably with a non-resorbable uh, material, non-resorbable barrier. But this is a little bit faster in healing, so we waited only four months, and you can see uh, uh, after six months after the extraction and four months after the, the bone reconstruction, we reopen the flap and we remove the screws, place the implant. This is a very old case. It's uh, still a soft tissue level implant and we could restore, as, as you can see in the next slide, the soft tissue profile is um, acceptable. It's even probably lower than the contralateral incisor and then we restored it and we have a long follow-up for this case that you can see in the next slide. 15 years later, uh, everything is there in place. You, you see that the only extra thing we did, we extracted the first molar at the time of initial uh, treatment, uh, 15 years ahead, and we placed an implant there and uh, for the rest, the dentition is not touched. The crowns are still the ones that were present uh, 15 years ahead, and I think that I saw these patients through a few days ago, and in the next slide you can see 17 years uh, after uh, treatment, very stable result. Uh, the bony peaks are there, and uh, it was achieved uh, with a relatively uh, fast and simple procedure, considering the overall, uh, the overall problem of the, of the patient. So for me, the decision on a single tooth situation is uh, not easily the case in periodontally compromised patients that have an involvement of, uh, I would not say the entire dentition, but most of the, of the tooth that, of the teeth that are present in the arch. So uh, I did it the way the minority of the audience would do. And, uh, but as you see, we have four, four surgeons here and everybody goes for a different exactly Luca because now we come to the <laughs> essence of the primetime debate I think we've all seen you share cases that turned out well in the end different routes to get to the same results so can we spend the remainder of this hour to determine what are the limitations and opportunities of each choice right to help people say what to do when Francesco what what would you what would you assess as a limitation of uh, tooth saving? When do you stop and you decide well? well I think that there are some uh, patient-related factors and some tooth-related factors. Patient-related factors are, re are related with the uh, capability of plaque control that is absolutely critical. So we need to have absolutely a perfect plaque control and perfect gingival inflammation control. And uh, on the other end, we need uh, to have uh, a perfect control of mobility. We are uh, dealing on uh, teeth with uh, advanced periodontal lesions, so we need to have a perfect splinted teeth in order to stabilize the coagulum. Obviously, it's very important also the endodontic status of, uh, of the tooth. Again, we are, we are discussing of uh, infrabony defect that uh, uh, are close to the apex. So there are several factors that we need to take in, into account in order to use periodontal regeneration that is, again, a very predictable procedure in the long term. I want to underline it again. It's a very predictable procedure and it works very well, although, again, there are some patient-related and tooth-related factors that are absolutely important. Would you consider it a technique that is uh, uh, sensitive to the, capa to the surgical capability of the dentist? Yes, I mean, every surgical procedure, the stage of the approach, the post-extractive require, a, or your approach require a learning curve that is critical. So, uh, you know, as a professor, uh, my suggestion is to do a learning curve uh, by treating uh, simple cases before, and then after, you know, a good experience of flap surgery, maybe time to do periodontal regeneration. I think that uh, the learning curve it's very important. Yeah. Okay, if I might check, would you go as far to say if patient and, and circumstances allow, yeah. always go for this approach first, 
yes, and absolutely. only when it's impossible I would move to either the implant yes. stage to immediate? Yes, absolutely. I think that we have a clinical international guideline suggesting that the infrabony defect by itself, you know, is a perfect situation for gaining bone. Originally. Mm. So yes. it's a perfect condition for gaining bone. Uh, although I prefer to understand that, you know, some titers are presented by Luca, maybe you no know, borderline this type of treatment, and some reason may suggest to remove, to extract, and to do uh, implant application. This is for sure we are dentists and we are here to save teeth, not to extract teeth. But of course, there are conditions where you have to go for extraction. Absolutely. No doubt. Uh, Goran, what would, you, uh, what would be your comment on the uh, multiple step procedure that you have mm -hmm. presented? Do you think uh, it could be made a little bit simpler or you think that this is uh, needed in all cases? Absolutely not needed in all the cases. So of course, we started with the risk assessment. And the case that I showed, I mean, there was really several aspects were negative. I mean, there is a bone defect, a soft tissue defect. Uh, so as I mentioned, in the cases, for example, with an intact buccal plate, and if there is a possibility to go to place the implant after two months or early implant placement, we skip the, the, the rich preservation procedure. If there is not, not a soft tissue defect, in the beginning, and again, also then, there is not necessarily need for soft tissue grafting. So really depending on that, that was actually the pretty much the worst case scenario. I mean, mm -hmm. not completely, but quite a worst case scenario. Yeah, but this is what we're talking tonight about. I mean, uh, periodontally compromised teeth in the aesthetic area, of course, usually, if you think about extracting, they don't have the buckle bone anymore. So yes, uh, yeah. this, is, this is the scenario. So, I, mean, I think reducing <laughs> steps is related just with some risks. I mean, I mean so uh, not everything is uh, proven by evidence, but I think it's quite obvious to, to think, I mean, that uh, immediate implant placement in a, in a uh, infected site, I mean, there is potentially increased risk of infection. And then, of course, there's the management of hard and soft tissue. So we saw from many studies, I mean, work from from your group, Jan, and uh, another study from, uh, from uh, Cecilia, again, that again, in terms of the soft tissue management, there are risks, so there are limits, and we can expect a high portion of patients with soft tissue recessions over time. I think we all agree on the fact that you need to control the infection before even starting about Absolutely. planning the case. So, so this is, this I think has to be uh, explained and clearly stated to our audience, not only in single tooth, but also in multiple teeth issues. We continue to see cases where periodontally compromised patients go to the dentist that removes everything and place the implants at the same time, still with a periodontal uh, mm, uh, infection in place. And this is for sure not a good way to... So the tabula rasa concept is very risky. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. We started with that in the Tell Me More About session uh, tonight where we had exactly the, the same point made. So uh, good, that is a repetitive message here tonight, Luca. Yeah, well, we are talking about challenging cases and uh, I think that it's important to give at least some clear points to the exactly. audience. Exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. So let's go deeper into the limitations indications. When to choose what? Uh, let's hear Rian what, what, he would, uh, what he would quote as limitations of his approach. Well, the limitation is the, the, the situation itself, so the buccal bone wall. I would say if you have more than 50% loss of that wall, then you might reconsider. I don't say per definition it's a no-go, but you have to take into account a lot of other factors and then everything needs to be favorable, I would say to come to a predictable outcome. And uh, immediate implant placement should then not be the goal uh, by itself. You know, we need an implant. Mm -hmm. And I think predictability is important. Uh, I'm also an educator, so I don't want to teach people to jump into fast treatment concepts when it is not predictable. Uh, and for predictability, yeah, we need those randomized control trials. And on those critical situations, we don't have them. So it is also difficult to perform a randomized trial uh, with a patient in such a complicated clinical scenario. Huh? Obviously. To tell, me, to tell him we are going to choose the, the treatment <laughs> plan based on an envelope, you know, it's not, yeah. it's not that ethical. So yeah. I think we will have to wait a lot of time until we get some randomized clinical trials on this topic. Uh, I have one question for the three of you. How do you consider the interproximally bony peaks of the adjacent teeth? 
in this scenario? How important is it for you to make a judgment of the attachment level at the, at the ancient teeth when you plan your treatment plan? Oh. Do you want to start, yes. Gordon? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's really part of the basic risk assessment. So when we assess the hard tissue and the soft tissue <coughs> volume, we know that the level of the bony attachment at the adjacent teeth defines the level of the papilla. Now, I mean, there are several scenarios here. Uh, I mean, one, things go in the direction we know if we do extract the tooth and do not restore immediately. Uh, we know that the papilla are going to flatten down but they actually not get lost because, I mean, the, bo the bone is there. So basically, we also know when we restore the implant and insert the crown, so these papillae are going to fill up the triangles again. But if there is a missing bone level or reduced bone level, I mean, that is something which uh, can very hardly be corrected or it's partially impossible to be corrected. And therefore, it's the patient needs to be informed that probably we're going to end up with a reduced level of the papilla. And what about you, Francesco? I think this is a challenging uh, question yes, for you. I think that uh, uh, for sure the loss of interdental, the critical attachment level at the adjacent teeth is, I mean, is the peak of regeneration to, for in periodontal regeneration. So uh, it's very important to assess it and to consider that the coronal level of interdental papilla is, um, is connected to the uh, clinical attachment. So uh, I think that is very important in periodontal evaluation at this point. Uh, I think also that, again, as Goran suggested, we, have, we need to discuss it in order to manage very rational aesthetic requests by patients because we can do periodontal regeneration, we can feel an infrabony defect, but we are not able to predictably move the, pap the interdental papilla in a coronal position, unfortunately. Okay. Yes, it, it, it was told one of the advantages of immediate placement, of course, because when you have a provisional crown, you have immediate support of the soft tissues. And this has been also shown in a study where we compared immediate restoration to immediate placement with, with a removable prosthesis. In that last scenario, you see the flattening of the papillae when you install then a provisional crown three, days, three, uh, three months later, sorry, you see that they are coming back. And after one year, you have the same level. But unfortunately, at the mid-facial aspect, as you have, have told us a few minutes ago, you see this, this effect is permanent. And that's why you need, you need an immediate support, not because of the papillae, because they will come back whenever you maintain the bone peak, but because of the mid-facial issue. That's why I like in your approach that you try to make a minimal incision when uncovering the implant. You don't open up the papillae anymore because whenever you do that multiple times, you increase the risk for losing it. Yeah? So that would be uh, that's important, I think. Yes, that's a, that's a good part of uh, Goran's presentation, for sure, for sure, very interesting. Uh, but uh, again, what is the take home message for you guys to, to bring to the audience? Uh, well, reach the infection control and save it. If uh, you need, you can use very nicely dental implant. <laughs> <laughs> Safety is first. If not, go for the implant. Yes, yes, of course. So from my side, uh, of course, we start with risk assessment. And we, we have a difficult case with a compromised situation. I mean, if there is infection, hard and soft tissue defect, then it's more predictable to do one miracle at a time. Ah, I agree. I agree. And then for me, I would say an implant is not a treatment for periodontitis eh, to start with. And if you have made a decision that an implant therapy is suitable in that patient, then comes the, the, the timing of implant placement uh, into the discussion, not before that. And then you take into account uh, local factors, such as bone availability at the apical part, the buccal bone wall, and, and these are the most important ones, I would say. If we don't have other questions, uh, okay. Can we? Yes, yeah, sure. Because I think we have a few minutes to do. It's, it's about, since we also say, let's save the tooth first. It's a, it's a question that came in for you, uh, Dr. Cairo, from Ion Vasileanu. He says, do you use something to acconditionate the root surface when you perform periodontal regeneration? Do you do yes. anything specific there? Yes, we have uh, two great options in periodontal regeneration that are underlined by the clinical guidelines that are the use of uh, 
barriers, membranes, uh, mainly resorbable barriers today, and then we have enamel matrix derivative, and they require the application of ADTA uh, in order to promote the uh, application of an enamel matrix derivative. So it means that we need to do a perfect root planning and then to apply the ADTA only when uh, using the enamel matrix derivative. I have one other question for, you, for the three of you. Aren't you scared in a periodontally compromised patient that has a, periodont a global periodontal involvement of the uh, horizontal bone loss that will happen in the, in the years after you have performed uh, uh, an implant supported restoration that uh, usually stays there while the, the tissues around the teeth recede time mm. by time, of course, in 10, 15 years, and this will create uh, uh, an aesthetic issue. What is your point? Are you referring about the buccal uh, gingivalization? But buccal or also interproximal. Uh, when, when in those cases, in the long term, you always lose some kind of support. And uh, around implants, you, if you have uh, good control of the disease, good control of the hygiene, you usually have a, a stable situation. So how do you deal with this? Well, I think that uh, um, long-term uh, longitudinal studies in Perio clearly demonstrate that our patients are absolutely stable in terms of bony levels. Uh, although we can detect very easily some increase in gingival recessions uh, in the long term, and this may be due to uh, you know, to the number of uh, instrumentation due to the supportive periodontal care program in a sample, but it's much more important to understand that probably the increase in resection may be associated with the residual amount of keratinized tissue in s under some specific condition. So this is why uh, in some specific conditions, in your case that you did at the central lower incisor, some gingival augmentation may be absolutely useful. Okay, okay. What do you think? I mean, the supportive therapy, as Francesco said, is, I mean, that's the main, the, the, the main aspect. Otherwise, we don't even consider implants. Of course, we don't necessarily like to place implants in patients with general periodont periodontal <laughs> problems. And therefore, uh, we need always to consider other reconstructive uh, restoration, like, for example, tonight we saw this beautiful minimal invasive uh, uh, resin uh, resin uh, solution with resin bonded bridge. Which Referring is to the battle now, eh? for yeah. our viewers who joined <laughs> later, yeah. check it so out on our video on demand section. Which, <laughs> yeah, so it was uh, just fantastic results with the modern techniques, with the modern material, and uh, yeah, without the use of implants. Mm -hmm. Okay. So uh, there, there seems to be a little bit of a, a theme emerging uh, through the night, right? So implants are a great option. We kicked off the voting where everyone went for implants. And throughout the night, we consider different options as well. Luca, we have been talking for almost an hour with our experts here. We have been listening to their presentations, battling voting. What do you hope that our people watching at home take away from this and apply in either their own scientific or clinical context? First thing, these are very challenging situation for the dentist. I, I think that most of the audience know this in advance, so be very careful. Don't try very strange and risky things. First of all, treat the infection. Second, of all, con second thing, consider very carefully to not to extract the tooth, to keep the tooth. Uh, of course, it might be challenging, but it's probably the best option for the patient if the tooth can be there. And if not, uh, you can go for immediate implant placement and immediate restoration only in very selected cases. In all the other cases, you have to go for a stage approach. Of course, you can add uh, different other supportive therapies like alveolar ridge preservation, soft tissue grafting, GBR, but go step by step. Don't rush because uh, immediate implant placement and immediate provisionalization can be applied in periodontally compromised patients only in very selected cases. Very, very clear message. And with that, you show that all the approaches at the table have their use as long as we understand when they do and when they don't. Of course. Right, that's the message. And that's why we have the prime time debate. In the end, there might not be so much fuss, uh, fighting. The gloves no stayed gloves. on the no table. Gloves. But uh, we hope that you, it helps you to kind of determine what to apply in what situation. 
We come to the end of the uh, hour. Let me uh, thank you, Luca Cordaro, for preparing this session and also to our experts for all the hard work to transform a traditional Congress session where you just present into a lively conversation that we had. Thank you, Goran Benic, yes. Francesco Cairo, and Jan Cozin. And thank you for your active participation as well in the voting, in the chat, and the questions. It's thank been you, Gerrit, for the <laughs> hard work. <laughs> I work. I do my best. Thank you, gentlemen. Coming up soon on the Digital Days, the challenge of the night. Massimo Simeon, I've seen him around in the studio, and Giovanni Zuccelli will argue on which surgical treatment of an aesthetically failed anterior implant, there they are again, is the best. And later on in the late night show, you remember this session from last year? It's quite different from the regular Congress presentations you're used to. We want young generations to be inspired by renowned experts through a different type of interview, more entertaining than usual. You will learn about the life, the stories, and she will answer all the questions you never dare to ask. Tonight's guest, Anne Wennerberg. But now.